and pick up where we left off on Friday. So we were talking about complex numbers. Um, so just to remind you quickly, if we have a number like 3 plus 2i, so more generally, we write this as a plus iv. So here i is the square root of negative 1. And we can think of these numbers in sort of a geometric way as points in the complex plane, which is usually written as a, uh, a bold C like that. And here if we have a, a number like 3 plus 2i, we can think of that as the vector from the origin to 3, 2, but also this number has, so this, this is A, this is B, this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis. So this a complex number like this, the real part is the part without the I, the imaginary part is the part with the I. We can do arithmetic with these in the usual way. Um, what I sort of ended with last time is that we can also think of these in polar coordinates. So in polar, we can have a plus ib. So if we think of this as having some angle theta and some length r, then r is the square root of a squared plus b squared. And theta, well, theta is whatever it is. It's the, the so the tangent of theta is b over a. And this is called the modulus. Or sometimes it's called the norm. And this is called, and, and theta is called the argument. And I'm not going to go through multiplying and dividing the arithmetic way, but I did that on Friday. However, what I finished with at the end of Friday is if I multiply so if I, if I multiply, say, z, which has uh, modulus r and the argument theta, and I want to multiply by some other number w, which has modulus s, and argument B. Then what I do is so is I multiply the moduli and I add uh, the angles. So to multiply complex numbers, so if I think of them graphically, here's theta. Let's just make r and s be 1, so I don't have to worry about that for now. Here's z, and let's put w over here. So this has angle c and modulus s. Then when I multiply these two numbers together, I add the angles. So, I'll put it out here. I said there would be one and I lied. So, ZW would be over here. I know this picture is horrible, but this is 
Uh, I don't know. How many, how many people have seen this before? Three? Okay. So, so I mean, this, this makes sort of multiplication of complex numbers a little bit more like something else, a little more intu intuitive and also a little more useful. So, for example, we can see here, if you think about the number i here, what's the argument of i? What angle does i make with the real axis? 90 degrees, we usually call it pi over 2, but okay. So the argument of i is pi over 2. If I multiply i by itself, This we already know is negative 1, that's how we set it up. But also, notice that negative 1 has an argument of pi. So the modulus of negative 1, which is just the absolute value of negative, I don't have to keep writing mod, you can just write absolute value. So the size of negative 1 is 1, and the angle the argument is 180 degrees, it's pi. If we multiply by i again, well, that's i times negative 1. And again, here, the modulus is still 1. But the argument, I've added on another quarter term. And so on. I, I the fourth is plus one again, which has modulus one. And the argument, well, is either zero or two pi, depending. It's the same issue as with polar coordinates. If I go, so there's I Q and here. I to the fourth one. So just like polar coordinates, if I go two pi around, I'm back where I started. So the same thing here. Um, okay. If you divide, then you subtract angles. So that's, if I want to divide complex numbers, so if I want to multiply, is that clear? The division is subtraction of angles? Maybe not quite. I don't know. So for example, 1 over i, this is, uh, well, this is negative i. Because the modulus of 1 is, is the angle 0, the modulus of i is the angle, I mean, they're both modulus 1. The argument of 1 is 0, the argument of i is pi over 2. I'm going to subtract, so this guy, the argument of negative i, negative pi over 2, which is the same as 3 pi over 2. So I subtract angles when I divide. Okay? So, I mean, there's actually a fair amount of geometry in complex numbers, which just comes from this business with multiplication corresponds to addition of angles. Now, there's a sort of a surprising, when you first see it, relationship between complex numbers and something else you already know, where, so what, what, in what other context do you know that multiplication of things corresponds to adding of something else? Logs. Logs, well, logs go the other way, right? Logs, addition of the, of the, in, of the inner thing corresponds to the multiplication of the outer thing. So, so you're close. You're just backwards. Exponentials, right? If I multiply two exponentials together, I add the power. So this is not a surprise. It's actually the same thing. 
So I want to put this notion, so we have this notion for a minute, I'll put it aside for a second. And I want to look at a couple of infinite series. So the infinite series for the sign, let's say the Maclaurin series. So we know that the sign of x has the Maclaurin series. Let me just write the terms. So there's no constant term. So the Maclaurin series, which I'll write over here, n equals 0 to infinity of minus 1 to n, because it's an alternating series, but the powers are just the odd powers. And that means that there's no constant term. The first, the linear term is going to be an x. Then uh, there's no degree 2 term. The next term is x cubed over 3 factorial. There's no fourth degree term. Then the next term is x to the fifth over 5 factorial. And so on. I'm going to stop there. And the cosine. fits in between, it's the other terms, so the cosine is the even terms here. Uh, so the cosine starts with 1, there's no linear term, then the next term is x squared over 2, except it's a minus, and then the next term is x to the fourth over 4 factorial, and then the next term is x to the 6, blah, blah, blah. Now these look kind of like something else. Right? I don't know. Well, let me just write down e to the x looks sort of like this, except the signs are wrong. Right? e to the x has the series just x to the n over n factorial. So it has all of the terms like that. So everything that's on one of these two lines is there, except the signs are wrong sometimes. So what would happen, I guess I can just leave that up, what would happen if we decided that x was going to be a complex number? In fact, let's take x to be a purely imaginary number. Let's take e to the i times x, just for fun, well actually, for because it's a good idea, and let's see what we get on the series. So the first term is a 1, and then the next term here gives us an i times x. And then the next term here gives us i squared x squared, but i squared is negative 1. So that gives us a minus x squared over 2 factorial. And then the next term here gives us i cubed over 3, i cubed x cubed over 3 factorial, but i cubed is negative i. And then the next term is i to the fourth, but i to the fourth is 1. And then the pattern repeats. In the fifth term, I will get uh, an i x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus, so now I have an i to the sixth, which is really i squared times i to the fourth, so that's a minus 1. So that's x to the sixth over 6 factorial, x to the seventh over 7 factorial. And here, oops, this will be minus i. And then the next one, and it will just keep going. The eighth term will just be x to the eighth over eight factorial, and so on. 
So here I go, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus. And have an I, not an I. Oops. Not an I, have an I, not an I, have an I. So every other term has an I in it. And every, I don't know how to say it, the, 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 the signs, S-I-G-N, go plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, minus. Now, this looks a lot like these two things stuck together. Notice that the cosine terms, this part, this part, this part, this part, this part, that's exactly the cosine. So this is the cosine. And then these other terms, well, they're almost the sine, except they have an i in front of them. Right? If I just put an i in front of every term here, I will get this term, this term, this term, this term, and so on. So if I just look at the series without paying any attention to what it might possibly mean, it says that e to the i x is the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. <coughs> so this, this is a very famous formula. Usually it has a theta. So usually you would write e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine of theta. It goes by the name of Euler's formula. And you may have seen, sometimes but not really quite understood, or maybe you understood, that e to the i pi, well, so what's e to the i pi? So if you're following, then you would understand. Just read. It's the cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. Well, the sine of pi is 0. The cosine of pi is negative 1. So that tells me that e to the i pi is negative 1. Which, in fact, if you write it this way, e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0, then you have, like, all of the math constants in one formula. All the important numbers. You have e, you have pi, you have i, you have 1, you have 0. You have, like, lots of important constants all in one formula. Um, so what is that saying? What is this really telling us? I don't know, it just looks cool, all right. Look at it. If you think of polar coordinates, so this is telling us that our polar coordinates for complex numbers are really exponentials. Um, because if you look at these polar coordinates that are here, uh, where are they? I don't know. Somewhere there were signs and cosines. Let me just do it here. If I have a complex number z, who has real part a and imaginary part i times b, so z is a plus i b, well, If this is an angle theta, and this is a link r, then what is b? Well, b is r sine theta, and a is r cosine theta. And we've just worked out, so if I have z is a plus i b, so that's r cosine theta plus r times plus i r sine theta. I can factor the r out.
And now this is e to the i theta. So that means that if I think of my number in polar coordinates, the radius is just the real number that comes in, far, in front, and the angle we can write as e to the i theta. That also makes the calculation that I did that multiplication is just adding angles almost obvious once you have this. Uh, so if I wanted to multiply, if, if z is r e to the i theta, and w is s e to the i phi, well then z times w is just the usual way that you would multiply these things. That's r s e to the i when you add the angles. Oops, that's a phi i theta plus i phi. So that just says multiplication is adding angles. It's exactly the same. Division, I would just change the sign, S-I-G-N, of this guy, and multiply, so it would be subtracting angles. So again, we have this relationship. Um, this relationship also means that all of the, many of the stupid trig formulas that are hard to remember, like what is the cosine of theta plus phi, or what is the cosine of five theta, become trivial. If we wanted to figure out a formula for, if we wanted to figure out the trig formula, so in some sense, to teach trigonometry, first they should teach complex numbers, and then it would be a lot easier. Right, so that was kind of a joke, but not really. Um, so suppose I wanted to know what the fifth power of this is. Well, this is easy. Right, this is just e to the i times 5 theta. So that was easy. But also, I could do it as cosine theta plus i sine theta to the fifth. Maybe fifth is too high to start. Let's do the double angle. So that's cosine squared theta plus 2i sine theta cosine theta minus sine squared theta. So from this I can now immediately read off the fact that, so that's going this way, and going this way, this is cosine 2 theta plus i sine 2 theta. So there's the double angle formula. The cosine of 2 theta is cosine squared minus sine squared. And the sine of 2 theta is 2 times the sine of cosine. And if you want a fourth angle formula, you do the same thing by just figuring out squaring this again. And if you want a fifth angle formula, you square it again and multiply by cosine plus i sine. Is this Clear to people? No? Whatever? I mean, it's not. Let's see, what did I skip? Um, so, no, okay. This also, so, maybe that's enough. So, this means then that you should be able to, so if we were still doing clickers, I would make this be a clicker problem. You should be able to find powers of complex numbers without too much trouble if you, have, if you know the angle. 
So for example, what is uh, 1 plus i to the 10th power? So you can do this a long way by just figuring out you know, the 10th power of this binomial, which kind of is a sucky way. Or you can think 1 plus i is here. In polar, this has a length of square root 2. And the angle is pi over 4. We're raising it to the 10th power. So what's the angle? of the 10th power of that. Yeah, 10 pi over 4, which is 5 pi over 2. So this is square root 2 to the 10th, e to the 10 pi over 4, i, which is the same as, so this is 5 pi over 2. And square root 2 to the 10th, is the same thing as 2 to the fifth, right? Because take half of them and square them. And 2 to the fifth is 32, I think. So this is not hard. Makes it actually a little easier if you know that this angle here is 45 degrees. Oops. So 5 pi over 2, of course 5 pi over 2 is the same thing. You can subtract off multiples of 2 pi. So this is really pi over 2. Right? 5 pi over 2 is the same thing as 4 pi over 2, or 2 pi plus pi over 2. So what number is this? What complex number has an argument of pi over 2? i. The length of it is 1, so it's 32. It's 32 i. So that's saying, I start here with a length of square root of 2. I wind it around a bunch of times. I wind it around five times. And I land here at 32 i. The angle here is 5 times this angle, because what did I do wrong? Oh, it's 10 times the angle. Okay, got it. It's 10 times the angle, and that's why it lands up here, because 5 times the angle is here, so 10 times the angle is here. Okay. so. The main point of doing this is twofold. This is not a, a class in complex analysis. If you are going to be taking physics, uh, or advanced physics, especially optics or quantum mechanics or things like that, then for sure you will use a lot of complex numbers. Quantum mechanics is essentially all complex numbers. Um, and we're going to use them from time to time. So like if you looked at paper homework, the paper homework that's due at the end of the week, there's something about complex numbers in there, kind of sort of. Not really. Um, and so, and complex numbers will come back again. So the point of bringing them up now is number one, the polar coordinates that we talked about before, here they are again, um, in a different form, and they'll come back again. And then these complex numbers will also come back a little bit in a couple of weeks, maybe not. But this is a very important, uh, well, okay, Euler's formula is very important. So now I'm going to change topics yet again. So that was appendix, I don't know, I, something like that. There's some stuff in there about the, the Marvers formula. It's really just this. Um, but let me move along. So, 
the remainder of the course will it'll seem like we're changing gears. There is a relationship between what we've been doing and what we will continue to do. Each piece builds on the next, but we're going to change gears a little bit now for the rest of the class. And we're going to talk about differential equations. Um, which means this is a, so differential equations come up a lot in a lot of things. So a lot of times you have a situation where, so we won't, sorry, we won't talk about differential equations in all of its detail uh, or even in a lot of depth, but we'll have enough to sort of scratch the surface and so you'll have some familiarity with it. There's a, a, an entire semester course on differential equations that is uh, calculus four, but these come up in a lot of that, in a lot of applications. You've, you've probably encountered a couple already. So, for example, you might have a situation where you have some population, and we want to describe the growth of you know it's a population of bacteria or rabbits or whatever. And we want to know, how does the population grow? Well, if you only have a few, then the growth rate is not very much. Because, I mean, not the growth rate, the, the next generation will be small because you only have a few things breeding. But if you have a lot, then the growth rate is large. That's saying that the change in population is proportional to how many you have. Usually there's a, we think of p as a function of t. And this function of t is telling us that the birth rate or the change in population is related to the current population times some constant. So if every, let's, let's say they're bacteria, and every bacteria divides once an hour, then that means that the growth rate in terms of hours will be double every hour. And so this factor would be something like two. So the, the, the population here is proportional. equation because we're saying there's some function P of T satisfies the fact that it's the fact that its derivative is some constant times itself. So this is a differential equation because it's an equation involving derivatives. We don't know the function at the start. This is sort of like in the infinite series where we have a series, we don't necessarily know what the function corresponds to, it corresponds to something. So here we, we have a relationship between the function and its derivative. Now do we know any function that satisfies the fact so we know some function whose derivative is a constant times itself. The exponential, sure. So here, so we, it's, it's easy to see it's easy to see that e to the kt satisfies that equation. So if P of T is e to the KT, then we can check 
because p prime of t is k e to the kt. And here we have, we want p prime is k times p. And here we have k e to the kt equals k e to the kt. So it's good. So, if you have some formula and you plug it into the equation and it works, then that is called a solution of the differential equation. So we would say that ke to the kt, not k, p of t, ke is a solution. is a solution of this differential equation. You just plug in and check, and it works, then that's a solution. Um, are there other solutions? So let's, let's actually, let me make this be a specific equation. So, so let's say that I have the differential equation. Obviously, it doesn't need to be a p. Sometimes it's a y. And sometimes we don't write the, the, the of t. So we write the differential equation y prime equals 3y. OK? So what is the solution of this differential equation? Give me a function y, let's say f of x, so somebody tell me a function of x whose derivative is 3 times itself, yeah, e to the 3x, yes. Are there any others? Can I add a constant? Maybe. Let's check. e to the 3x plus 5. So does that work? Let's check. So then y prime is e to the 3x. And so is it true that y prime is 3 times e to the 3x plus 5? No. Because e to the 3x is not, oops, did I lose the 3 somewhere? Oh, well, there's a 3 here. Okay. 3e e to the 3x is not equal to 3e e to the 3x plus 15. So I can't add a constant. Any other possibility that I can do? So there's an entire theory that tells you exactly whether we have all the solutions or not, and that later. But just from playing around. Does anybody have? Yeah. Is the over 3 in the. Do you mean here? Like that? Um, so that doesn't quite work. Because when I take the derivative, I get 3e to the 9x. I mean, I get, yeah, 3e to the 9x. And that doesn't equal 3 times 1 third e to the 9x. Right? With 3 times 1 third e to the 9x is just e to the 9x. So that doesn't quite do it. Really, nobody has any idea? Yeah? 
integrate both sides. Well, with respect to what? This is, remember, dx. Okay. And this is a function you don't know. So you can integrate both sides if you're clever, and we'll get to that really soon. But we can't just integrate straight away. Because this is not x. This is y. So it's it's possible, but not that possible. So, okay, I guess I'll tell you. You can add a constant, but you don't add the constant. You multiply the constant. So if we take y equals any constant, then its derivative is 3a e to the 3x, which is 3 times y. So there's a constant of, there's a constant there, but it's not an additive constant. It's a multiplicative constant. So your idea of add a constant was right. You just have to add it in the right way, not by adding it. So anyway, there's lots of solutions to this equation, and they depend on some constant a, but not adding. It's not the plus c that you get from integration. It's a times c. And that's actually related to your question, can we just integrate both sides? If we manipulate this a little bit, we end up taking the log. And so we're adding the constant in the log. And so when we exponentiate, it becomes multiplicative. So, so his, his comment about the log and your comment about integrating both sides are both good comments. They just need a little to make them happen. So we'll do the later. Um, okay, so now didn't I would have thought that you might have done this a little bit in your differential calculus course, no? Uh, we did like exponentials in there a little bit, but it was a long time ago, so we forgot. It's okay. So we're starting a little easy. Um, there's other variations that we can do here. So, for example, so the idea here is the, the point of this right now is to just get you to think about differential equations a little bit. Um, if we have, say, a weight on a spring, that's supposed to be a weight. Is it coming? I don't know. Okay. If we have a weight on a spring, we know something about this. We know that Hoke, from Hooke's law, which we did a little while ago, says that the force is proportional, so the amount of effort it takes to stretch this is proportional, some constant, is some constant times x, where x is the amount we move. Right? Now, if we aim, if we make x go up, then maybe it's negative here. Just x is the height. So, right, this, this is the, the spring, the way that it's drawn, the spring has a restorative force. So, but we also know that force is mass times acceleration, and acceleration is a second derivative. So we also know force equals mass times acceleration, which is mass times, so if, if the block is at position x, then this is the second derivative here. So if y y describes the position of the block, well, I guess I have it in x, okay. So we have minus kx equals 
I guess there's a genie here. So let's just put all of that into some. Okay. So this k is not that k. So we can absorb all of this junk into some constant. Let's call it k. And we have a differential equation here that tells us there's some function x of time which is proportional to negative, so the second derivative of x, x is describing where this block is, is minus some constant times x. So if this x of t is describing the position of the block, then x of t will be described by this sort of a differential equation. This is called a second order differential equation because there's a second derivative. Now what function do you know whose second derivative is the same function except for changing the sign? Yeah, the sign. Also the cosine. And in fact, as we'll see later, the solution to this kind of an equation, depending on the value of this k, is related to sines and cosines. So x of t here looks like, so I'm just going to make up some numbers, a sine t plus b cosine t. So for suitable choices of a and b and suitable time scales t, this will solve this equation. So I didn't relate k and a and b and stuff like that. Um, we can also come back to this population equation. I mean, this works well for small populations with lots of resources, but sometimes we have limited resources. There's, there's limits to growth. So, so let's think about this, just try and think about this as an equation that is describing a situation. So we start with population is some proportion, oops, the derivative of the population, the growth of population is proportional to how many there are. But if there's too many, there's not enough food. So let's imagine these are rabbits and they live in this big nice green field with lots of grass and no wolves. They live in a nice rabbit, rabbit preserve. It's not like strawberry preserves, it's different. Um, so they live in a nice rabbit preserve, and the rabbits have lots of grass, and mm, they can breed like crazy. And now there's just tons of rabbits. You go to visit the rabbit preserve, and it's like, get out of here, get out of here. You can hardly walk through. It's like, it's like those, you know, those horrible movies you see about chickens and egg farms and they're just everywhere. So how would we adjust this to say that in this, in this place there can only be, say, 1,000 rabbits and if there's more than 100,000 rabbits, if there's more than 100,000 rabbits, there's not enough food and they start to die. How would we adjust this, this thing? So this says the growth is proportional to how many there are. But if there's too many, then the growth will be negative because they won't get enough food. So how can we adjust this to say that there's some upper limit to the growth? How can we make the derivative be positive for small values? and negative for big value. 
So what, what would this say in terms of If I'm thinking now not of the solution, but I'm thinking of pop it, well, I don't want to do that yet. Anyone have any sort of idea? No? Yeah. So, okay, so that's what I decided not to draw, but since you said it, I guess I will. So the solution that we're looking for would start if this is time, and this is the population. You're saying, well, if we have not too many, then they go fast. Maybe they start kind of slow because there aren't too many. And then, then it's, you know, springtime for rabbits. And they grow really fast. So here we have, you know, just the Adam and Eve rabbit. And after a long time, they have lots of descendants. But then they start running out of food. Maybe they overshoot. Something like that. Right? That's what you're saying? So this is the kind of solution that we're looking for. So that's good. Let me just smooth it out and make it simpler. So, or you could think of bacteria in a dish. You put a couple of bacteria, and then pretty soon you got a few. And then they just go crazy, but then they hit the edge of the dish. And then they stabilize at a given, at a given population. So this is often called the carrying capacity. Because it's the capacity of whatever the system is. And in fact, such a solution, so what we want to do is put another factor in here that says that if it gets too big, you subtract. Again, A is some other constant unrelated to K. So this is sort of how fast they grow in the absence of limitations, and this is the limitation. Once you achieve this limitation, notice that everything here is a positive number, well, except for this one with the minus sign. So that would mean that if you get above A, the derivative is negative. Which means that if for somehow I manage to have 15,000 rabbits, then things would die off. Because the population rate would be negative. It would be something forcing it back down to the level of A. This is called a logistic equation. The names don't really matter. Um, but in case you encounter these names, this is a logistic differential equation, which is a model of population growth with limitations, but it comes up in other things. So what we'll be doing for the next several weeks is we'll be examining differential equations in general and solving them. We won't be doing so many modeling problems, although we'll talk about some of these modeling situations, but we will also be figuring out how to do what you suggested of integrating both sides, how to make that work.